I will. Now let's continue this um, this particular teaching. Now we began off by mentioning uh, our brothers uh, Tavis Smiley and um, Dr. Cornel West, complimenting their their efforts, their courageous efforts to um, speak truth, as it says, speak truth to to power and and even to this particular president. Um, how much he has heeded. Uh, how much he's willing to um, um, to be positively affected by that still remains to be seen. But one thing should not be in doubt is that, unfortunately, our president, the present president, our first African American president, is in is in the crosshairs. He's really in the crosshairs. Even with the recent comments by um, Hank Williams Jr., it, it's almost like a warning, and we need to. Um, note this today, and need not to look at this as a, as a minor, as a minor thing, because we're living in in very perilous times, very dramatic times, times where there's been some great changes, and the only other time that really, in recent times, it's like this, actually, is the 1960s, and we all know of the various events. Um, that happened in um, 1960s, in the 1960s. Now, when we said that um, Moses is dead, when we mentioned this message a couple of years ago in one of our videos, that um, Moses is dead, and then we likened, um, in a sense, Moses to the, um, the, the civil rights movement. Um, it, some people were offended by that. As events quickly um, uh, quickly uh, manifested themselves, um, they began to see many for themselves, and some even um, confess. You remember there were those, uh, I think, ten blind blind men, and 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 Christ had healed um, all ten, and only one came back. We had our one or so that have come now that they can see and even recognize that they were hateful and angry at us for speaking the truth. You know, the truth is an offense, but it's not a sin. They were upset and angry that we spoke such blunt truth, but as events turned around very quickly, they began to see for themselves that um, we only have done that which is right and truth by speaking the truth, even if people um, didn't like it, because um, that is the responsibility of all the children of God, because he has not given us a, a spirit of, uh, of fear, as the word says, he has not given us a spirit of fear. So, we're in the book of Jeremiah, we find ourselves in the book of Jeremiah, and we find a particular question um, being, being asked. Uh, can America be healed? Can Babylon, in, in the prophetic sense, can Babylon um, be healed? And there's um, many different opinions about that. Can Babylon be healed? Many still believe. They still believe in the American dream. But as we have shown from the book of Jeremiah, that there's a woe to the pastors, the pastors and the preachers in particular, the pastors and the preachers that destroy and scatter the sheep of Yahweh's pastures, of, of, of Jah's pasture. And we find this word in Jeremiah chapter 23, which speaks on the future restoration and the conversion of Israel. Now, when we say Israel, we are primarily chiefly speaking of Israel in the sense that Yahweh, in the sense that our, our God and Father, the God and Father of our black Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, is speaking of Israel in the sense of the once lost but now found black sheep. We're speaking about the black sheep of the family. And when we utilize such books as um, uh, the Valley of the Dry Bones by Rudolf Windsor as a reference point, or when we speak of um, the book known as From Babylon to Timbuktu. These two particular books right here basically give us a, a, a background, a background to our story, but these are some suppressed literatures. 
these are suppressed literatures. They're not taught in the schools. They're not taught to our black children. Uh, they're not taught to the black people. And whenever they are brought up in certain contexts, they are often um, dismissed by our enemies or by our own people who are deceived, who are under delusion of our enemies or who have sold their souls, basically, to, to lie to our people. But it is clear in the word that there is a particular woe to the pastors and the preachers. And what we want to touch on right here is the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement. And, and, and now some hold to the civil rights movement. Excuse me. Um, they hold that this was the, 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 best, the best time. Obama's election basically should show you because Obama was not primarily elected by the, the classic um, black boule bougie not by that. They got on board later on when they recognized that he had real potential. Um, Obama originally seems to have come from the black liberation, that black liberation set. Um, Jeremiah Wright being one of the primary examples of that. And we all remember what Jeremiah Wright said. Everybody jumped up on top of Jeremiah Wright and said that Wright was wrong. And we said that Jeremiah Wright was right but he wasn't white to say that if Jeremiah Wright was white and had said what he said, there probably would be a, a whole different perspective because there's a lot of white preachers who for um, other reasons basically say that America is under a curse um, or America has gone away from its godly foundations. There's a lot of other ones. In fact, there's those um, there's other church that protests um, whenever... There's a funeral of American soldiers killed in action. They protest and hold up flag, I mean signs and 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 placards that say that um, um, God hates fags and other things like that. And that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, with this new um, Justice uh, Roberts, they, they ruled on this particular um, freedom of speech, and they said that the church. That particular church has a right to say what it's saying, even though it's offending a lot of people who feel that their children or their loved ones have given the ultimate sacrifice for defense of the country by losing their life in one of the various wars or conflicts that America's engaged in. And then you have um, some religious group or Christians who are protesting, saying God hates fags and so forth and so on. But then this went to the Supreme Court because some wanted, the families wanted this to be stopped. They felt that this was hurtful and so forth and so on. And Justice Roberts basically said that um, it is uh, their rights. Not that he was the only one, but he was one of those main ones who, who, who led a particular opinion. And um, they have the right to do that. Yet when ones like uh, Jeremiah Wright of the, of the, um, the, the Trinity Church in, in Chicago, the church of um, the former church, I think, of Oprah Winfrey and the former church of the Obamas and, and others, when he said what he said and when Obama was running for election, Obama, as many of us saw, basically he threw Jeremiah right under the bus and he kind of distanced himself from that. Now, that we've gone through about three or so years of the Obama presidency and other things have become clear and obvious and overt and manifest, many people are having reconsiderations about their um, former distancing from Jeremiah Wright because Jeremiah Wright, as we said, he was right about what he said. And he was one of the few preachers or pastors that regardless if you if you like what he said, so forth and so on, doesn't matter if a person likes it or not. It's whether he's being faithful to his master, whether he's being faithful to our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he was and showed himself in that firestorm to be faithful. And Obama still won the election. I mean... It, some say even if Obama didn't say anything, 
he would have won the election because he, he had that popularity at that particular time. But obviously in his campaign, they felt that they needed to distance himself. Maybe he had to prove himself to to, to who knows, um, the Bilderbergers, uh, who this or that, or secrets, or whatever, you know. And But he did what he did. Now, in the matter concerning the civil rights movement, and I think this is very important, and we don't know how much time we would have to to really articulate this particular point, and it's probably best that we articulate this point um, at this present time. If you would turn your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 23, Jeremiah chapter 23, it has a message for us, and in particular for us as black people. And the very interesting part of this particular prophecy is concerning this idea of the dream. So this American so-called dream, is the American dream a lie? And is what Dr. King seems to have advocated, at least that portion. Remember, this, Dr. King said many things. He, he spoke on many relevant and important issues, but the only issue that the media has kept front and center is this idea of the so-called American dream. And this is ironic because if you look at everything that Dr. King, Martin Luther King said, and at first we didn't even look at the fullness of it. We saw that dream thing because this is all the media talked about. And then when we read Jeremiah chapter 23, we said, oh, Jeremiah chapter 23 is speaking against what King, King was a faithless shepherd. Oh, my God. You know, and this really, you know, made us sad. You know, of course, because we're taught that Dr. King is one of our great um, black men, and, and in fact he is. But then when we're reading this, we're saying, well, if he's a preacher, how could he not, if he could put other things in context, how could he not put this in context? Or, or, or did he ever touch on this particular chapter? And it would be important for us to also touch on this, but this is the main area. Verse um, 22, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 22, it says, But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. In other words, if the preachers and the pastors, see, part of our problem as, as, as this lost sheep, as black people, part of it, of course, we know is the, the slavery, the racism, um, is our our tortured history in the Americas. Um, we can say it's, it's the white man part of it. That's part of our problem. But then there's the other part of our problem that even allowed us to get to that point where the so-called Gentiles or white man could do to us 400 plus years ago what they did to us. And in some very significant ways continue to do it in a in a more technologically advanced way in a more subtle way. In fact we was watching um this might be a little bit off the point, but I don't think it's really off the point. We were watching um um the view the other day. We caught a clip of the view. And they were talking about um I think is it is it Perry, Rick Perry, one of the Republican um contenders for the presidency and the whole thing that the the, the black Republican candidate had said, um, he brought it up um, about the nigger head, the whole nigger head comment. And on The View, a couple of, you know, the, the hosts were talking, Whoopi and, and the other black girl, I don't forget her name right now, but the other black girl was talking, the heavyset black girl. And um, they said the N-word, right? And they were, some of the people on this show were acting shocked, like um, Barbara Walters, that this word is still, you know, like, you know, like, how come, well, actually, she said nigger. I think she said nigger. She might have said nigger. We couldn't really hear because they bleeped it out. But um, her name is Sherry. So Sherry got offended at well, how, how, how 
Barbara Walters said it, and it's a very interesting clip. I, I don't know if you'll see it. If somebody, of course, they put it up there. This, this clip is up there. Maybe people have talked on it. I'm, I don't know. But I saw the, the clip when it originally aired. And it's really interesting because what Sherry is saying that even as a black person, she takes offense when basically a white person says nigger, and particularly when a white person says, like the way I think, um, um, uh, what's his name, Whoopi said it. Whoopi said it like probably nigga, 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 like the ga, ah. And um, Barbara said it with nigger, 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 you know, in the more white slur, uh, slurred racist kind of, with racist connotation. And Sherry had made these comments about, you know, how she didn't like one white person and, 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 Barbara is like getting offended. It's a very interesting comment. Maybe we have to do something on that, but check it out for yourself. It's a very interesting comment. Um, well, of course, you know, the black girl had to kiss Barbara's ass, basically. Call her, ma, ma, you like ma. White bitch is your mother? What the, what's he talking about? I mean, let's be straight. Let's be straight about it. But what, here's what's interesting. When so-called European Jews are speaking about the Holocaust, whatever, do black people jump up and say anything about it? We're not even talking about the Jewish role, the white Jewish role in the slave trade or the Jewish onslaught. We, that, that issue has not even um, become front and center in media. It's just a basic issue about how white people say, and maybe they shouldn't say nigger, or how they say nigger, and how it still offends black people. And then white people would be like, well, how come y'all can say it? And black people say, well, the way we say it is, is different, and the connotation that we use with it is different. And then white people say, well, we don't understand that. You know, they play ignorant. You know, white people playing ignorant, like white people don't understand. They don't want to understand. They full well understand. And Barbara Walters, I know she full well understands, but it was running this psychological thing. And so Sherry is trying to explain this and that, and, 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 and Barbara's like, I never knew this. If I knew that you felt that way, you know, and I'm thinking like, wow, Barbara's like, I'm about to fire this nigger biatch. You know, I'm about to fire her. And then after the break, you know, they came and did a kumbaya, you know, and th these things are so overt, open, and obvious, and I have to ask myself, what progress has really been since the 60s? Think about it for a moment. All black people have done is pretended like um, slavery and oppression, down oppression didn't exist. All they did is pretend to be ignorant while white people threw some money at them, put them in some roles, opened up certain doors, affirmative action, you know, added some black people to, to the board or to company and gave some jobs and they moved down to white areas and they intermarried and such and such. So then that, it's like black people sold themselves for cheap. But is it just the black people, the regular people, or... Was it the preachers and the pastors? And we have to leave this back to Dr. King. Not Dr. King only, because I think it was, I think Dr. King was a more progressive. And if he had lived, we would have heard him really um, becoming more revolutionary. I think this was the threat and this was the fear. And this is one of the reasons why he was killed. But we believe that well, the white folks killed Dr. King. I think that it's more of a conspiracy, just like uh, Steve Coakley and, and, and um, even Dick Gregory and some others have done lectures over the past several years where they've gone into some of the other individuals, even mentioning um, Jesse Jackson. So therefore, it doesn't surprise us when Jesse Jackson makes the comment about cut your balls off, you know, the, the cut your balls off comment that he made when Obama talked about black men stepping up, black men being better fathers and so forth and so on, black men manning up. Well, yes, we as black men have been greatly effeminized, you understand, even by saying the white man is the man. He is the man and still looking up to Caesar's Christ, a whitewashed Caesar Bourgeois image, a falsified antichrist image of our Lord and Savior, not recognizing our Lord and Savior as being one of us, but looking up to this false idol image of um, a white Jesus. We have been effeminized. 
You know what I'm saying? And we have not. How to make a slave speaks about how the black man and the black woman, how they were broken, and it explains every sort of the majority, should we say, of the social um, crises that now popular media, like all these new so-called shows on TV, where black men and black women's dirty laundry is exposed to all of America, and then some white person is coming in, masses is coming in to solve the situation, and then none of it, like we saw a program today. And it's a little bit off the subject, brothers and sisters, but bear with me. Um, we saw a program today, I think this news show, Jeremy Kyle, all of these bum-ass um, English people, it's like another British invasion, in other words, all these bum-ass English people coming over. And we remember the last time in the, um, not the Civil War, but the War of Independence, how they, they rallied us on their side, or the, the, uh, how the British wanted us to join their side, how we did join their side, and they just did another white people, white man trick on us when it was all over. You understand? They, 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 never, they, ne they never really benefited the black people, even though they appealed to us by calling us Ethiopians, recognizing us as Ethiopians and Ethiopian regiments, so forth and so on. But um, there was a show today, I think it was a Jeremy Kyle show, where there's a black father, and he has his three children, and um, he's being, like, beat up and demonized for, like, so-called choosing drugs over his three black children. Like, he walked out, and his reasoning is that he, he didn't know what to do. He, he, as a black man and being, being addicted to crack and these drugs, you know, cocaine and heroin, speaking about real drugs, real hard drugs, you understand, because nobody, like we said, nobody sells their, their TV or sells their morality for a spliff, for, for, for herb. You know, nobody has sold their TV for, for a nickel bag. You understand, but people have sold almost everything they have, the whole stereo uh, entertainment set for a, a couple of vials of crack to get high, you know, to get high a couple of times. They've sold a lot of things. So drugs, even the drugs in the inner cities, this is part of a concerted effort to destroy the lost sheep and to stop the rise of a messiah. If you read the Cohen-Tell Pro carefully, it doesn't say we say stop the rise of a black messiah. But if you read the FBI memo, you understand, it actually says to stop the rise of a messiah. So this is antichrist. This is very antichrist. In other words, our enemies. We got to know our enemies. Our enemies are antichrist because they sought to stop the rise of a messiah, and they recognize that the only true messiah that could be must be a black messiah. They recognize this. This is where COINTELPRO is one of the most significant, in addition to its overt and obvious implications. It is significant because it proves what the Bible speaks about in the latter days of the Antichrist, to stop the rise of a messiah. And the only people that are targeting are the same people who Jeremiah Wright even likened to in his, in his teachings. Um, when you look at who crucified Christ or who killed Christ, it was the white Italian Romans. It was the Romans. You understand? It was the Roman Empire. So the dichotomy was even there between the white Gentile oppression of the black Jewish and Hebrew population, and it has not changed. It has not changed. 2,000 years later, it has only gotten worse. And what's worse about it is that 2,000 years later, the lost sheep don't even know their true identity. They're trying to be everything, you understand, than who they really are. So in this particular show, like a lot of other shows, it's blame the victim. It's blame the victim. I was surprised. I said, well, maybe this black man, like, you know, he, he's admitting he's not perfect. He, he says he's... He's sorry about it, and the children are very, you know, hurt, of course. They're very unforgiving, and many of us as black men are in some form of that situation, whether we were on so-called crack or cocaine or drugs, like many of our um, 
brothers and sisters and, and foreparent, why is the victim being blamed? Because this, this, is, this is all part of the system. The, the system, if, if you mention, well, what about COINTELPRO? They brought drugs in for the express purpose, and then when white people in white neighborhoods get hooked on methamphetamines, it's viewed as a medical condition, a social condition where the people who are caught up in the families that get destroyed are victims, not of the victim to the drug addiction, but are victims of the drugs or are victims of the drug pushers. Who's the biggest drug pusher in America? Unfortunately, COINTELPRO proves that it's the United States government. So these are just a couple of things that, you know, and, and these things have been happening not like over a long period. This, some of these things, even the, the, the thing in, with Amanda Knox that we commented on briefly, where two black men got scapegoated for that. These are all recent, where there's the, the, the Conroy, the, the doctor, and the Michael Jackson killing, even though others are saying that there was another doctor who has a very suspicious Dr. Klein or something, who has a very suspicious involvement. But they said, well, they're not going to point out him. The prosecutor's not going to touch him. We want, we want just the black man. We want to lynch the black man. So because of Obama's election as the first African-American president, even though he may think he's getting pressure in his position, he does not understand the amount of pressure on black men because of him, and he, in his position as Tavis Smiley and as uh, Cornel West and as many others, in his position, he is not doing what he needs to do to provide us an opportunity to do what we need to do because he basically wants us to shut up and, and, and stop whining and stop complaining and, and don't talk about it. And that's what the Obama Pophis is about. The, the next video that we have to post up there. Um, and uh, anyway, anyway, be that, be that as it may. We, we're going to get into this a little bit more. Um, we got a little bit, I won't say sidetracked, but in, in looking at these issues, and these are just issues over the last, these are recent issues. This is not us going back to the 1960s. We we're not going back to the 1970s. We're not going back to the 1980s or 90s or the early 2000s. We're talking about things that are happening right now. We're talking about things that are happening right now. And ones are so blind that they cannot really see how all these things go together. You understand? All these things are, as one economist spoke about the economy, he says, there's a systemic problem. The, 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 whole, the whole political system is, is, is broken. So many things are broken, but what's really broken is the lost sheep. We as black people, we are really broken. We are disconnected from our identity of who we are. See, when we begin to recognize who we are in the Bible, it does not take away our responsibility. In fact, it puts the responsibility for even getting in this situation, firstly and foremostly, not on the white man, but it puts it on us. But then it helps to explain to us how we have been victimized as well as giving us the way out. And this is why it has been suppressed. This is why a, a, a true and a, 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 a rational teaching of the Beit Israel and our identity has been suppressed. And we give thanks and praise and we pray often and we, and we ask our brothers and sisters to pray that we be allowed and others be allowed also to, to, to share in this ministry of the good news of his imperial majesty and to put this word out, to share this word of others. Not all at first will be willing to receive it. Many will deny it and ignore it and say, no, that's you making excuses. But who has brought the drugs in to the inner cities? I mean, and we have documentation where this has been planned 
by the government. What's so interesting about the whole drug situation in black America, it, the recent thing with the guns, you know, the Mexican guns thing, um, where the government actually was behind letting these um, fast and furious, I think they call it fast and furious, letting these guns out and how many um, innocent um, Mexicans and even Americans and others are being killed by these guns that were part of an FBI or a government plan, just like COINTELPRO, part of a government plan. So when we see the violence going on in Mexico and, and on the border and in Texas and in other parts of the country, it's easy to blame the victims. You know, it's easy to blame the victims. But we need to know the half of the story. You understand that is not told because ignorance, as we've been saying over and over, is the is the original sin. There's more to come on this. Um, we're going to get back on track, but still the question is, can America be healed? Can America be healed? Can Babylon be healed? Reference Jeremiah chapter 51. Read it. Weep. Pray fast, but listen to the message. There's a very important message there for us, my people. So shalom once again. Arastasalikum.